everybody. My name is Mary Maida. I'm with Canine Cancer Alliance. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, we want to um, just uh, share with you what happened in 2023 and what some of our thoughts are for 2024, and also talk about the promise of immunotherapy, why we think immunotherapy is so exciting, but there are some limits, and we're going to talk about that. We'll share with you some of the things that were accomplished as part of our program, um, made possible with your donations and funding, um, but also some of the discoveries and findings from other research programs that were made at veterinary schools and other research centers and try to answer questions like, you know, what new treatments are becoming available? What are the limitations of some of the treatments? What are the new research areas? And really importantly, why does cancer resist treatment so much? But before I start, I do want to thank everybody for supporting us uh, through volunteering with us, um, through donations and running fundraisers, really. Uh, we're just so, so grateful. And as you know, the funds that we raise goes to research. Uh, we are starting to use some a small percentage of that funding to create also educational material, and we'll share more about that. But um, I do want to um, uh, say thank you to uh, Jordan Katzman, who has been just incredible in uh, helping us on the strategy on a day-to-day -day basis, as well as Corwin Mallet, who um, sadly lost his dogs to osteosarcoma, but who has generously supported um, EGFR HER2 clinical trial and uh, is, is being a wonderful supporter. Again, thank you. And let's just start. So let me just start with what, tell you what immunotherapy is. It is different from conventional therapies that tries to directly kill cancer cells. It's using the natural immune system to find and kill cancer cells. And so in this picture, which I hope you can see, it shows the cancer cell on top and on the bottom, T cells. Now, T cells are one of the workhorses of immune cells system that's very effective at killing infected cells as well as cancer cells. And uh, T cells can hunt for cancer, recognize it as being bad, and kill it. T cells are not the only immune cells that can kill cancer cells, but uh, it is one of the uh, very important components of the immune system. And the reason immunotherapy is so exciting is because of its precision that uh, you could have an immunotherapy that is very specific to cancer proteins, cancer antigens. So it's not harming healthy cells. It's very precise. And it also does immune surveillance. That means the T cells and other immune cells are going around the body looking for cancer cells that are trying to spread and metastasize. So it's not just local, it's systemic. And uh, chemotherapy is systemic, but it is indiscriminate in you know killing healthy cells and tumor cells. So uh, immunotherapy is precise and it does full like body systemic surveillance. And if designed properly, it there's memory. So immune system remembers that this is what cancer cells like. And if cancer cells go into remission and then they pop up a few months later, it will recognize it and start killing it. You don't have to give it more chemotherapy or do another surgery or get more radiation. Immune system can remember. But of course, things are not perfect. In general, immunotherapy may have associated with it milder side effects and it can limit recurrence and metastasis. So how effective is immunotherapy? And I like to share the Kaplan-Meier survival curve, which plots the number of patients still alive versus time. And very often, the, um, for example, for chemotherapy, the number of patients starts out 100% and it starts to go down, 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 down. And over time, if it's really aggressive kind of cancer, most of the cancer patients have passed on. But with research, you might come up with a new chemotherapy. But very often, the Kaplan-Meier survival curve just shifts over a little bit uh, because in general, some patients are living a few months longer, maybe six months longer, but it's a shift. But eventually, if the cancer is aggressive, most of the patients uh, succumb. Now, compared to that, immunotherapy looks like this. Uh, and this is a little bit simplified, oversimplified and idealized, but unlike chemotherapy curve that just goes down to zero, sometimes you find these long-term survivors and the, so the curve flattens out and you call that the survival tail. And that's what makes it so exciting. When immunotherapy became very popular a few years ago with human medicine, uh, something called checkpoint inhibitor, about, I don't know, 10, 15% of patients with uh, very aggressive melanoma 
who are becoming long-term survivors. So they're seeing this flattening out. They're seeing this tail. And also with canine cancer immunotherapy, we may be seeing these tails. And that's one of the things that we're trying to find out. And so if there is a tail, that means that there are long-term survivors and effectively those patients hopefully are cured. And then the challenge is how do you raise this tail? How do you make the immunotherapy more effective so that more patients can respond to the therapy? In 2023, we were supporting a number of studies. Uh, some were funded uh, in 2022 and uh, got started earlier, but the largest study that we are so supporting is EGFR HER2 vaccine study, which was started at Yale University, and Professor Mamula has joined us today, so I hope he'll be able to share with you some findings from that study. We also added a couple of new studies focusing on the gut microbiome and the immunotherapy, as well as the impact of short-term fasting to immunotherapy at Oregon State and Ohio State University. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. We have also been supporting uh, and enrolling patients for uh, small pilot trials at Missouri State University and the University of Illinois, looking at different kinds of immunotherapy, IL-12 immunotherapy and CAR-T therapy. And also another pilot trial with immunocidin, which is a nonspecific immune stimulator. It's not specific to cancer antigen like EGFR or two or certain protein, but it generally boosts the immune system in a way that may be beneficial. So these are the projects that we were able to support with your, with your support. And Mark, since you're here, <laughs> uh, I would love for you to um, share what you have. I, I was just going to say that you are enrolling, your studies enrolling patients with osteo, hemangio, and transitional cell carcinoma. Now at 11 clinics. I just heard that one clinic is only going to focus on osteosarcoma, I think, in Northern Virginia. I will update that. And um, Theragen is the uh, company that uh, Mark and his team has started to commercialize this vaccine treatment. And it's so important to have a company that can take it through regulatory process so it actually becomes available to veterinary uh, practitioners because very often there might be really promising research and clinical study, but then you don't hear anything. It never becomes commercialized. And then it's not available to anyone. So hopefully we'll see more of these promising research results turn into real commercial products. And, and Mark, I was also gonna mention that your published survival, survival, 12 month survival with about 43 patients was like 65% versus more like 35 to 40% with conventional therapies. That's Mark, correct. Would like to, yeah. Would you like to add anything else to <laughs> what's happening with your study? Sorry to put you on the spot. Uh, it, Mary, you always put me on the spot, but in a good way. It's fine. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss it. In fact, sometimes I feel like I talk too much and too long about what we do. But let me say at the outset that uh, it really was... It, it would not have happened without support from uh, the Canine Cancer Alliance, yourself and and uh, Corwin Mallet, who is uh, on, I believe, on this group as well. It's there are a lot of competing strategies to tackle this very difficult problem, cancer in dogs, and uh, it's difficult, it's time consuming, and it's expensive. So it's it makes it challenging to rise to, to get the work done, to rise above the others that you're competing with. And you and Corwin were, uh, I was lucky enough that you uh, believed in us. And in fact, it did lead to uh, uh, the new company being formed. We're not making any product or profit or charging for it yet. Yes, we are in clinical trials at 11 places, as you mentioned, those places, those sites are listed on your website as well as theragen.com. We continue to acquire data for USDA licensing, which we hope is impending. And the data look very, so far, look very similar to what we did in an open label trial of this therapy, this immunotherapy. We're doing it in a more systematic way at the moment and in a more restricted group of patients, as you already mentioned, osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma, and transitional cell carcinoma. And uh, we continue to acquire data. The program has been 
honestly much more popular and accepted than I anticipated. All of the clinics are pretty well subscribed with patients. I'll apologize up front if you can't readily get an appointment with these clinics. They've Some of them have been overwhelmed in part due to, uh, oh, people finding us on the Canine Cancer Alliance site, as well as other social media sites. Uh, I can talk about the details of the study. It's going very well. We're collecting data in a central database here at Yale that allows us to really dive deep into details of patients that are doing well. And, uh, and even we learn from those that don't do well. And the parameters can be many. You know, we have things like very detailed clinical data from every dog, uh, including the usual things like age, gender, breed, location of tumor, size of tumor, imaging studies that are ongoing in all of these patients. So it's a lot to digest literally, but all of it hopefully will lead to uh, something that we hope we have wider distribution to uh, anyone who is interested and available to, to use it. Mark, can you say anything? Can you share anything about hemangiosarcoma? Uh, the hemangiosarcoma, very honestly, is, as we probably, most of us know here, is the most aggressive of the tumors that we're studying. And I have to be honest and say that many, I'm not sure if we're moving the needle on overall survival in this group, but again, it we're still analyzing that. Uh, hemangiosarcoma is the most aggressive tumor. My own dog passed away from this uh, very rapidly about 10 years ago. So I know very well about how this tumor can progress. However, we do have long-term survivors um, in this hemangiosarcoma group. Uh, and I know that long-term survivors uh, with standard of care are very rare. Do we have more than standard of care? <laughs> Without without having the numbers in front of me, I, I think so, but I'm cautiously optimistic. It's a bit like, I mean, you were describing immunotherapies in melanoma, for example, Mary. And yes, there are a growing number of long-term survivors with melanoma, but unfortunately, the sad reality is that while it's it has changed the landscape of cancer care in humans, it does it it's far from improving the survival of too many patients a large still the majority of patients with melanoma and other very aggressive cancers still don't do well uh, with immunotherapy there is a proportion or a fraction of patients that do have done much better or even very well and that's sort of where we are with um, hemangiosarcoma is that we believe a fraction of patients, and we're trying to identify what are the features of those patients that do well versus those that don't do well. Is it the features of the tumor, which is probably true? Is it features of the dog age, gender, the size when, size of the tumor when they come into the clinic? A number of factors. I probably didn't answer your question perfectly and avoided it, actually, but I think it's it's the truth so far. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. It's, uh, and please jump in anytime, Mark. Um, I am not an immunologist. I am, uh, I'm not a vet. I'm a physicist. <laughs> <laughs> but I've lost too many dogs to cancer. So this year, um, one of the new projects that was started began looking at the relationship between gut microbiome and immunotherapy. Just as Mark said, um, you're interested in features. Who's going to respond? Who's not going to respond? What can we do to help increase chance of responding? And there are many, many human cancer studies that shows that if you have diverse, good gut microbiomes, it does help. And that uh, if you take fecal, if you do fecal transplant from a patient who responded to immunotherapy, give it to a patient who didn't respond and give that patient immunotherapy again, there's a chance that that patient will be become a responder. So that's how powerful gut microbiome is. And it's not as simple as just taking probiotics. Uh, but now a new study led by Professor Natalia Shulsenko is teaming up with Professor Mamula and Dr. Tripp and collecting fecal samples to see if there is, for canine patients, a link between microbiome and uh, immunotherapy response so that we can pave the way for perhaps using probiotics or fecal transplants in the future to improve the response. Another pilot study that was started last year is looking at fasting, short-term fasting, 
And uh, it's been known with human patients as well as canine patients that if you do 24 hour, 48 hour fasting before chemotherapy, it dramatically reduces side effects. And uh, so the question is, what about immune response? If you do short-term fasting, does that induce anti-tumor immune response in a tumor? And so this study is led by Professor Shai Baraka at Ohio State University, and he's looking at uh, osteosarcoma and melanoma patients. And these dogs will undergo 48-hour fasting before surgery, and they're going to be looking at the tumors to see what changes they can see as a result of fasting, because we really would like to improve immunotherapy, improve treatments, but we need it to be affordable, accessible. And dietary intervention is probably one of the hopefully easiest things that we might be able to try because you don't need new drugs. It's something that's under your control if designed properly. And there are now new human studies uh, that included many very aggressive cancer types. And these patients were put on intermittent fasting and a small subset of patients who were deemed incurable became cured. So there are some uh, increasing number of data and studies that is starting to uh, reveal the power of dietary intervention. So this is just a pilot study. Now, why doesn't immunotherapy work for all canine patients? As Professor Mamula mentioned, it depends on the dog. It depends on the dog's immune system, the tumor, many, many factors. But if only subset of patients are responding, can you raise that subset from 10% to 20% to 30%? What are the things that you can do to raise that tail? And I think Professor Mamula has stated many times in his webinars that tumors are heterogeneous. Uh, they're dynamic. They're not sitting still. They're not all identical cells. So they are uh, actively uh, trying to survive and manipulate the surrounding cells so that they can escape immune system attack. And they do that by actively changing some of the immune cells surrounding it into their friends their enablers, so that they can create new blood vessels, they can create a very immune suppressive environment. So many researchers, scientists, uh, veterinary and in human medicine are starting to look at what's called a tumor microenvironment to see what you can do to the tumor microenvironment to make it less friendly to the cancer cells. So I want to just mention to you some of the examples. These are not necessarily projects that we are directly funding, but some of the advances being made by other researchers at vet schools and elsewhere. Uh, and I'm going to just touch on um, something called propranolol, a beta blocker, and some of these repurposed oral drugs that are becoming available for cancer patients. Also PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor which is another immunotherapy that just became available last year to oncologists to treat some types of cancer. And I want to describe how that works and why it might be promising. And also mention to you the impact of antibiotics and neoadjuvant immunotherapy. I already mentioned that gut microbiome plays a big role in immunotherapy treatment effectiveness. But if a patient has been exposed to antibiotics, at least with human patients, there are indications saying that um, the patients exposed previously to antibiotics very often develop resistance to immunotherapy. Now, is that true with canines? And really, how extensive is that? that that's the kind of data that we would really like to find. Uh, neoadjuvant immunotherapy means that immunotherapy is introduced before other treatments, before surgery. And today, with osteosarcoma and many cancer types, Cancer is surgically removed, and then they do a biopsy, confirm that it's this type of cancer, and then maybe a few weeks later, start chemotherapy. Or maybe if you're lucky, you get immunotherapy. But human studies are starting to show that earlier immunotherapy started, the, there might be better outcomes. So again, that's something that uh, we hope that we will be able to uh, study and get answers for and figure out how to help more dogs get immunotherapy earlier, even maybe before surgery. So I want to spend just a few minutes talking about propranolol because this is a really fascinating drug. Um, many of you probably know propranolol as a beta blocker. It's a anxiety, blood pressure, hypertension medication. It's cheap. It's available very broadly for human as well as for dogs. But extensive studies show that it has 
Very strong anti-cancer properties. And this is not just with in vitro studies, but with human patients, retrospective studies, uh, and even with canine patients. It reverses tumor immune suppression in its tumor microenvironment by interfering with stress-related cancer progression. It inhibits angiogenesis and formation of new blood cells, and it induces cancer apt apoptosis. And, and there are now papers after papers and studies that are doing, that are both retrospective studies as well as prospective studies introducing the use of propranolol, perhaps during breast cancer surgery or melanoma uh, treatment to see what percentage, how the tail response might change and um, you end up with better outcomes. So propranolol is really interesting because again, it is cheap, it's widely available. So you don't have to wait for a drug company to come up with a, with a drug, it's a repurposed drug. And this is a picture that I found in New England Journal of Medicine, um, and it's total serendipity. This is a baby with hemangioma, which is a benign uh, form of uh, blood vessel cancer. And it's a little bit similar to hemangiosarcoma, exact, not exactly the same, but similar. But um, there were studies showing that uh, this baby with hemangioma, uh, it's not life-threatening, so usually it's it's not bad, but some babies had hemangioma that was bad enough that it was really interfering with if, um, quality of life. But this baby happened to be on hypertension drug, propranolol. And lo and behold, the with propranolol, when propranolol was added to the treatment, hemangioma uh, disappeared. And this triggered quite a bit of interest in using it for a malignant form of hemangioma, which is called angiosarcoma in human medicine. And um, there are very few angiosarcoma patients. Um, and so it's very hard, apparently, to run clinical studies with angiosarcoma sarcoma, but there have been case reports of uh, some patients responding very well because there are no very not very good options. Just like with canine hemangiosarcoma, there are very limited options for uh, human patients with angiosarcoma. So um, there is a professor now, Professor Aaron Dickerson at Minnesota, who is running a, a study with hemangiosarcoma patients looking to see if they add propranolol to doxorubicin, can you help extend the survival times? And these are challenging because she has to figure out what is the right dose, et cetera. Um, and there are also um, studies at Colorado State University uh, led by Stephen Dow and Professor Dan Reagan, who are looking at using uh, propranolol as well as another hypertension drug called Losartan and a uh, cancer drug called Tosernib or Palladia to see if by combining these oral drugs, you might be able to change that tumor microenvironment to make it less immune suppressive. And so they have published several papers and they've had uh, studies involving nasal carcinoma, glioma, as well as metastatic osteosarcoma. In fact, this is a dog who had metastatic osteosarcoma who was given propranolosartan and tosorinib, who ended up surviving uh, two and more years after osteosarcoma diagnosis and metastasis. Again, it's not; it doesn't cure every dog with metastasis, but uh, there's a hope that this oral drug mix may help change the tumor microenvironment to make it less immunosuppressive. Now, I said that I was going to mention uh, checkpoint inhibitors, which this is another way cancer uh, subverts the immune system. Um, on the T cells, on the surface of T cells, there are proteins called checkpoint molecules. And these proteins are basically off switches to turn off the T cell activity, because if your immune system is activated, it can really do harm. It can start attacking healthy cells, uh, good cells, and um, cause sepsis and all sorts of nasty things. So there are switches to turn off the T cells. But what cancer has done is figured out how to use those switches to turn off the T cell activity so cancer can survive. So these are called checkpoint molecules, and there are many checkpoint molecules that help turn off the T cell. But one very important one is called PD-1. And cancer has a ligand or receptor called PDL1, which will attach to PD1 to deactivate the T cells. So uh, researchers have come up with new drugs 
called uh, checkpoint inhibitors that blocks this interaction. So cancer can't turn off the T cells. These are called PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors. And in human medicine, PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor drugs have became available many, many years ago. And it is a very, very important tool now for oncologists. And it has been used in as I mentioned, melanoma and subset of the patients who were completely incurable, hopeless, uh, became cured. But again, it doesn't help all the patients, but there's a great deal of hope. I should also mention that with human medicine, PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors are you know, $100,000, $200,000 treatment therapies. Now, how about canine checkpoint inhibitors, checkpoint inhibitors for dogs that are affordable? So just this figure is just emphasizing the fact that cancer can put brakes on the T cells response, stepping on the brakes. So, so now there are PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors for dogs that's been designed for canine proteins that interferes with this binding so that cancer has less of a chance of turning off the immune system response. And this drug that's that became available just uh, in October 2023 is called uh, Gilbatmab. Um, it was uh, developed at Merck and uh, Merck um, has, a, of course, a human side, which has a human a checkpoint inhibitor that is a very big business. Now they've created a canine version called Gilvetmap, and uh, it interferes with canine PDL1 and PD1. And they have carried out studies with mast cell tumors and melanoma, and it is available to be ordered by veterinary oncologists today. So there are many, many, many questions about this field vet med and how well it might work to help canine patients. Could it help other types of cancer, not just mast cell tumors and melanoma, but uh, other aggressive tumors. And what's known with human studies is that PD-1 checkpoint inhibitors work better if there is high tumor mutational burden. There's lots of mutations associated with the cancer. Tumors with high TMB are hemangiosarcoma, osteosarcoma, and oral melanoma. So they, they might they might help. Uh, we don't know because there hasn't been studies with hemangiosarcoma or osteosarcoma with this that mad. Uh, how well will it work when it's combined with conventional therapies like radiation therapy or chemo? And uh, how about the interference of antibiotics? I mentioned that importance of gut microbiome in immunotherapy. Human study are finding that if a patient has been exposed to antibiotics, they do tend to, some of the patients do tend to resist more to PD-1 blockade, and they have shorter survival time after being exposed to antibiotics. So is that true with canine patients? And could, could this gilvetmab PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor be combined with something like um, other immunotherapy like immunocidin or EGFR HER2 vaccine or propranolol to CERNEV, um, those drugs that change tumor microenvironment. Could they all be combined in a way carefully so that more dogs can respond and we can raise this tail? So basically, gilvetmab, PD-1 checkpoint inhibitor is helping you take the foot off the brakes because it's it's just stepping on the brakes. Uh, even though with something like a vaccine or immunocidin or other immune stimulator, you are stepping on the accelerator. You're stepping on the accelerator at the same time, cancer is stepping on the brakes. So can you release the brake and step on the accelerator so you could go forward, but do this safely so you don't cause bad side effects. So that's a big if. So um, looking forward to 2024, uh, we are very interested in seeing uh, immunotherapy help more dogs enjoy durable remission, raising the tail remission. Combining therapy is a really, really interesting approach. Um, rationally combining vaccines or checkpoint inhibitors or tumor microenvironment modifying agents safely. We do want to put a great deal of focus on hemangiosarcoma because it is so aggressive. Taking uh, it is, it's just very tragic. And um, educational program. We've started putting um, some emphasis on educational program. When we started the nonprofit, we saw that other cancer foundations often spend a lot of energy and money on cancer awareness. And my initial feeling was, well, I, we know how bad cancer is. Why do we have to raise awareness? But I we realized that I think we do need to help get the word out about these evidence-backed therapies and clinical studies and research results. And so we are trying to put more emphasis on educational programs. Um, I also want to mention that early cancer detection is very important. 
earlier you can start immunotherapy or any kind of therapy, the better chance of better outcome. And today there is a handful of companies that are offering some blood tests, urine tests that detects cancer signal. Uh, right now, we've started partnering with a small company that's using canine scent detection to do early cancer detection. Uh, they've published some initial uh, papers about their data, but we also want to verify and independently see if it actually does work. And hopefully it can turn into a, a very affordable early cancer detection method and also possibly a way to monitor progression of disease. So if you are getting some treatment for osteosarcoma or hemangiosarcoma, Instead of waiting until you have clinical signs, maybe it's possible through these tests to see that cancer is coming back so that you can try something else or as part of a clinical trial that would guide how, how well the uh, therapy is going. So disease progression monitoring is something that we really would like to look at more carefully. So that's what we're looking at in 2024. I can't tell you exactly what projects we're going to start because this is all research. It depends on proposals we get, the conversations that we have with researchers, what's happening in different conferences. Uh, but I think 2024 is extremely uh, exciting. And um, again, thank you so much, everybody, for supporting us and uh, helping make research, more research possible so we can help more dogs. If you have any questions, um, let me know. Mark, do you have any other final thoughts, comments? Well, uh, first of all, uh, that was a terrific presentation. Very eloquent and perfectly done. Beautiful illustrations and very thoughtful presentation. Thank you, Mary. Um, just to emphasize, you know, there are, unfortunately, there are a few barriers uh, that exist between treating human cancers versus cancers in our pets. And that's dogs or cats, I suppose. In part, it has to do with the economics of human health care and, and canine health care. And the obvious differences are that of things like accessibility and cost. So, you know, it's great to all, many, not all, but many of the therapies that have been applied to treating dog cancers uh, originated, at least in part, from how uh, success, the, the success of therapies in treating human cancers. Unfortunately, as you pointed out, checkpoint inhibitor therapy in humans is hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and will continue to be that way. And of course, that's just unaccessible for, you know, at the moment for canine cancer care. Although the Merck product that you described has the opportunity to penetrate the, the canine cancer care market. Um, that's, I guess, yet to be seen. Uh, there are great studies, as you described, in treating melanoma and whether it works elsewhere will find out. Uh, unfortunately, the number of people who have insurance that covers a lot of these expensive therapies uh, is probably not where it should be. There should be more people that are covering their dogs with insurance. Um, and then is, you know, just again, to re-emphasize your main points, which is uh, human care as well as dog care will probably rely on better understanding the tumor microenvironment, uh, the things that cause a tumor to fight off immune therapies or avoid immune therapy um, strategies, and also uh, exploiting the things, the, the combination therapies that work together, and that's trial and error. Uh, and then finally, as you point out, early detection is always best. We, uh, I haven't mentioned this to you, Mary, much or anyone, but we are trying to initiate studies in defining what we call liquid markers of cancer. Liquid markers are things you can see in the serum, a blood test in dogs that would define early disease. The reason that diseases like hemangiosarcoma are so aggressive is that some of the outward signs, uh, dogs don't have symptoms as early, or they can't tell you when they're hurting. And some cancers like hemangiosarcomas grow far too quickly and aggressively before the dog has symptoms. Uh, the symptoms of osteosarcoma are a little more obvious, a lump on the leg, for example, which, you know, the owners can see 
uh, hopefully early on, but sometimes not early enough. But we'd like to be able to see the tumors that are solid and internal, like the hemangiosarcomas, uh, before they arise. And the tumors spit out small proteins in something called exosomes. They spit them out into the blood. And that's something we're trying to detect uh, in our cancer patients and dogs that we are uh, looking at. So it's been studied before in human cancers as well as uh, limited studies in dogs. And it seems to have great promise in, detect in early detection uh, of these tumors. Are you going to be uh, enrolling dogs soon in that study or is it still more? Uh, hopefully, yes. There is a collaborator of mine here at Yale. Uh, we have existing serum samples from our patients that we already have in the freezer across the hallway from me here. And uh, potentially we are going to do some pilot studies in the next couple months that uh, would provide some data that indicate, uh, you know, yes, there are things in the blood that we can detect that reflect uh, a certain kind of cancer, osteosarcoma or hemangio. That would be great. I, I think I've spoken to a couple of uh, dog parents who said that based on some extra images that they had from like a year before uh, swelling started or limping started, they actually saw something in the x-ray in that location. So it sounds like even him, osteosarcoma, it, it does start early and then it, there's no clinical signs for like six months or maybe even a year. And then it pops up and then by then it's, it's already metastasizing. So yeah, if there's a blood test, that would be fantastic. Affordable blood test. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, thank you so much. There are some questions on the uh, on the chat page that you oh, okay. want to address. Yeah, let me see. Um, okay, so Kendra says she has an appointment in Northern Virginia on March 13th for hemangiosarcoma for her seven-year-old Golden. I hope um, I hope they'll be able to. Um, Mark, do you know exactly, like, is there a, a drop dead? Is there a date when um, Manassas vet is going to switch over? It'll probably be uh, I'm still negotiating with that, okay. with them. Okay. There is another clinic in Northern Virginia that is also participating in all three cancers. So fortunately, even though the med vet in uh, Northern Virginia is restricting enrollment, the other clinic in Northern Virginia is not. Right, so. that's right. Uh, around, yeah, it's a few hours more drive, but okay. Um, Lori says that, is there um, a ribbon? Um, she doesn't believe there's a ribbon to recognize canine cancer awareness. There, there's a pink ribbon for breast cancer. Is there a ribbon color for canine cancer awareness? Uh, I'm not sure. I, we'll definitely have to look into that. Ashley says, does a dog in EGFR HER2 trial currently have to get past nine months mark before considering other immunotherapies like the ones mentioned today? That's a good question for <laughs> Mark. Yes. Um, well, uh, that's a difficult question. Um, we are trying to get one year data on the clinical trial of our study. So, but the, the difficulty in answering this question is a feeling that I've had myself in my own dog that had cancer is that there's a tendency to want to throw everything possible at your dog uh, in treating these diseases. Uh, that's not always the best way. Uh, I'll have to defer to your to the veterinary oncologists that are treating uh, the dogs in our trial to answer those questions. Uh, I feel like it would be a biased answer if I uh, spoke up about my own opinion of that, you know, I want what's best for yeah. your dogs as yeah. do the vet yeah. oncologists that are treating them. Um, we need, however, the best data that we can uh, with just our therapy combined with uh, sometimes with chemotherapy. Yes, yes, we, we definitely we want to throw everything. We want to do everything possible for a dog, which is different from the scientific objective of 
having getting trying to get clean. Well, yeah. this this also differs in how humans are treated with cancer, right? You can't walk into your human doctor and say, uh, "I'd I'd like to try," you know, this and <laughs> so that's a bit of the difference between you know how we treat our dogs and versus uh, human treatment. Uh, let's see. There's another question about appointments at 11 uh, at 11 locations. There's a long wait at some of them. Can we get the vaccine uh, to the local vet clinic? Unfortunately not. We're restricted by the USDA for certain clinics. Hopefully once we get conditional licensing, which we're hoping will happen in the coming months, it's a long process with the USDA, uh, then we would be available to local clinics. Uh, how do we volunteer for our cane? This is Lori again. Uh, how do you be a part of the study? Uh, dog has MCTs. I'd be very interested in participating. Call the clinics directly. Uh, I don't pre-qualify or enroll patients myself. Uh, I rely, you know, it, again, it's, I don't want to insert any bias into this clinical trial. Uh, you get the best care from the vet oncologists at all of the clinics that are enrolling our patients. Uh, well, mast cell tumors, Gilvetmab has been uh, in study with mast cell tumors. So uh, if you can't get the GFR2 vaccine, you may want to ask your oncologist about appropriateness of using Gilvetmab. Some, some researchers uh, or based on human studies, the checkpoint inhibitors do have limited efficacy. So the future of checkpoint inhibitors is probably a combination. So combining it with other immunotherapy, but um, um, definitely maybe talk to your oncologist about that. Is there a better yeah. prognosis with chemo and the vaccine? Oh, I skipped Amy's too. Mark, do you, can you say something about prognosis with chemo and the vaccine? Yes, uh, I guess the question seems to ask if uh, our the Theragen therapy um, is it's con it what contraindications uh, for other chemotherapies for most of the cancers that are being studied, uh, carboplatin and doxorubicin is typically the most prescribed uh, chemotherapy. Uh, we find that the immune response to our therapy is not affected by those chemotherapy, those two chemotherapies, um, they, carboplatin and doxorubicin do affect bone marrow. <clears throat> However, the cells that make immune responses to our therapy are not largely affected. We find that there's a good, good immune response, even when vaccine is given at the same time. Is that based on the antibody production or based on survival data? On antibody production. So uh, is, is there some chance that it might do some immunosuppressive thing with T cells, which you're not measuring? Uh, we have not adequately examined that question yet. Uh, we believe that the therapy, uh, well, this the therapy that we've developed is based on antibody-based therapies in humans, uh, less so based on T cell therapies. Um, there are some nuances to that in that how we formulate our therapy, it activates T cell responses to the tumor as well. But we largely rely on antibody responses to reflect how the vaccine is working. Um, and uh, we don't we don't see altered immune responses. So we and I we do have anecdotal evidence that we have not yet published that probably, as you point out, Mary, early uh, therogen therapy, the or what's been termed the Yale vaccine, not by me but by others. <laughs> Yale doesn't like me calling it the Yale vaccine. It's uh, it's infringing on their uh, uh, their domain, but. Um, the sooner the better, which is true in human therapies, right? The sooner you identify and diagnose and the sooner you get therapy employed, always better. Yeah. Um, there's a question. What are your thoughts on liquid biopsies like NUQ or Onco K9? So PETDX uh, has um, a test. They're both blood tests, different kinds, and they seem to have decent um, accuracy for osteo, especially for osteosarcoma and hemangiosarcoma. Not for all types of cancer, but osteo and hemangiosarcoma accuracy is like sensitivity. I should say is like eighty something percent. So um, 
I, I personally would like to get a pet DX test done for my eight-year-old golden retriever. Um, and we spoke with um, the team at pet DX about how effective or how helpful it might be to use their blood test to monitor progression of osteosarcoma and hemangiosarcoma. And they said that uh, they're going to be publishing their data soon. Um, so we're, we're waiting for that publication. Uh, at, at a conference, uh, I heard that there were some ca cases where with the blood test, they could see um, hemangio and osteo come back before clinical signs appeared. But uh, we're waiting for that data to be published. Yeah, I think that'll be very exciting if it actually uh, is. It, again, that's a liquid uh, marker of cancer progression, which we all want to see, of course, or want to know. Right. And see, Ashley says, thank you. We submitted our six-month x-rays to MedVet a few weeks ago. She's doing great with no recurrence or metastasis. Just wanted to be. <laughs> well, that's terrific. <clears throat> she's large, however. Okay. Has Gilvetmab been used on osteosarcoma, hemangiosarcoma yet in clinical trials? No, it has not been. And we would love to see that being used. Uh, Merck has um, a program where they will donate the drug Gilvetmab uh, to clinical trials, and you have to send in proposals uh, to get their donation. So it would be great if something like that could happen. Uh, otherwise, uh, Gilvetmab is not not cheap. So, um, so if there isn't any donation from Merck, then um, we would have to create a cohort of patients getting immunotherapy uh, or the vaccine plus Gilvetmab, but Gilvetmab treatment would be kind of pricey. So we have to, we'll have to hustle to do more fundraising or we'll have to have patient dog owners put the bill for Gilvetmab, but that is something that we want to see. Okay, is there evidence of pseudo progression in patients so far? Not that I've noticed, not that we have evidence for. Okay. Oh, effective the... palladia, palladia and losartan. Um, do you want to talk about palladia or losartan? Uh, or... So, yeah, so palladia, losartan, propranolol, those were uh, studied at mostly at um, Colorado State University and Tufts University. And they really wanted to see if they can change the tumor microenvironment so that it's less immune suppressive because cancer does make its environment immune suppressive. So um, they did have successful um, small studies with some successful results with Palladia and Losartan. So Mark, with your trial, I, I believe you are allowed, allowing patients to be on Palladia and Losartan in addition to getting the vaccine? Uh, that's correct. They're, they're not, they don't affect immune responses. Uh, Palladia is, uh, without diving into the detail, it's a small molecule that is used to prevent signaling in cancer cells. Um, and uh, as you pointed out, Lasartan is has uh, effects that uh, are not directly related to white blood cell responses to to uh, the vaccines, for example. So yes, both neither will interfere with the vaccine response. So Ken asks, why did Manassas suspend treatment for hemangiosarcoma? It's a question for you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> I hate to speak for the clinic. Uh, my interpretation is that the they've been overwhelmed by requests for people wanting to enroll into our trial and they understandably have allegiance to their existing patient database or the local patients that want to get into their clinic and they're having a hard time keeping up with the local patients that you know, say don't have these three tumors, they're still treating other types. They're treating many other patients, not just ours, with many other types of tumors. And they're having difficulty fitting their own tumor or their own uh, patients into their clinic. So Mark, how far do you think, um, when do you think you might have uh, approval to distribute the vaccines to uh, more clinics from USDA? Well, I hate to predict we're submitting more paperwork actually this week to try and address some of the um, the issues that they have. You know, the USDA wants to know all of the things that almost all of us want to know about, even about human drugs, um, how, you know, the safety issues, uh, how long uh, do, what, what's the shelf life of our therapy if we send it to people? By people, I mean veterinary clinics. Uh, we have data that we're submitting that it, uh, you know, regarding that, they want to know how we're 
uh, carefully analyzing immune responses, and there's a lot of detail there, uh, how we develop the assays to uh, identify immune responses, and, and a lot of minutia there. Hopefully in the coming year, we'll be up and running and getting our therapy out, I'm hopeful. Uh, and then uh, why is carboplatin chemo still standard of care for osteosarcoma when it doesn't appear to be affecting, effective at preventing metastasis? So um, carboplatin, there has been many, many studies showing that adding chemotherapy to surgery does extend survival times. It might not lead to a cure, it might not prevent metastasis, but it does extend survival times by many, many, many months. Um, so that's the reason. Okay. And it's so, affordable. Yeah. Okay. And Amy says, thank you, Mark, for all your passion and expertise. And I definitely echo that. Thank you, Mark. So um, I think it's one o'clock. So I'll let everybody go. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Mark, for joining us too. Uh, just one other big thank you to you, Mary, for organizing this gathering, uh, your thoughtful comments, and of course, support to not just our program, but uh, many programs that are trying to save our pups. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye. I'll make the recording available.